Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to speak in front of the Committee on Daughters of the Settlement. So just let me share my screen. So yes, here we go. So the subject of my talk is Julius Bean, the long-term president of the Bnei Brit, and its first historian. However, it is not his uh, neighbor activity that I will address here, but a particular piece of his vast artistic production, which is perhaps not widely known to neighbor members. Namely, I will talk about a Kabbalistic lithograph that was made in Paris in 1851 by a Hungarian rabbi, and then was reproduced by Bean in New York in 1859. Just as neighbor adopted to modern, modernity throughout its long history and responds today to the challenges of the 21st century, Julius Bean also refashioned this artwork to meet the taste of his contemporary. Thus, Bean's artistic thinking and approach may tell us something about the neighbor as well. Though before this audience, I doubt that Julius Bean needs any introduction for the sake of those who are less familiar with the artistic career of the father figure of Nebrit, I think it will be useful to give a little bit of a background information on him. Bean was born in Germany in uh, 1826, and although was originally destined for the Jewish ministry and was taught Hebrew and the Talmud, in which he excelled, he clearly uh, early on displayed artistic talents, which directed him towards a different career. He attended the Academy of Fine Arts in Kassel and then studied in the Städersches Kunstinstitut in Frankfurt under none other than Moritz Oppenheim. Uh, Bean got involved in the 1848 revolution, thus was forced to leave German lands and emigrated to Germany the United States. He set up a uh, lithographic workshop in New York in 1850 with one single hand press. At the time of his death in 1909, the Julius Bean Company was one of the leading companies in the field with 200 employees and 15 steam lithographic presses. The range of genres that his artistic produced encompassed just about everything from city views and illustrations to books of all sorts to art prints of glamorous athletes and bathers, animals, plants and mushrooms, posters, trade cards, cigar box labels, and other ephemera and advertising matter. Especially notable is his color print enterprise, the chromolithographic edition of Audubon's Birds of America. Nonetheless, Bean's main specialty was cartography, in which, beyond the staggering number of maps, he devised numerous innovations that earned him medals and state commissions. Bean had joined Nebret by 1850 and became a charter uh, member of the Sheba Lodge number 11 in 1851, with which he remained until his death. He was a long-term president of the order and uh, also the first historian of it, uh, writing the history of the order in his journal, the Menorah, in 35 installments. I have already mentioned two technical terms, lithography and chromolithography. Since the print I'm about to talk uh, is uh, a lithograph, it is perhaps not without benefit to give a brief overview of this technique. So what is lithography? The word comes from Greek, which means stone and writing. It is a printing technology involving limestone that was invented at the end of the 18th century by Alois uh, Sinefelder, who first called it chemical print. The reason for that lies in the process. The image is drawn on the surface of a limestone, which is then treated with various chemical substances. The uh, application of these liquids changes the physical property of the limestone uh, everywhere, except those areas where the drawing is made. 
Thus, the surface of the stone will have two kinds of areas with different properties, one that will repel the printing ink and one, namely the actual image, that will accept the ink and thus the print can be made. To be more, to be more precise, a large number of prints can be made and the ease with which any kind of image or writing can be produced and reproduced made lithography the leading technology of the 19th century, which was used across the entire spectrum of the printing industry. Numerous innovations were in introduced throughout the century, including the use of colors. This is called chromolithography, an area in which Bean excelled. The lithograph uh, that I want to talk about today is entitled The Origin of the Rites and Worship of the Hebrews. It was designed, executed, and supplemented by a 70-page explicatory volume by a Hungarian rabbi, David Rosenberg, in Paris in 1841. Rabbi Rosenberg was born in Tokai in 1793, and after serving in a Jewish community in German lands and spending some years in Brussels, he moved to Paris in 1830. His years in the French capital were, were his most important and productive years, both as an artist and as a Freemason. He was admitted into a lodge of aristocrats with princes, dukes, counts, marquises, and barons among its members. The size of the lithograph is impressive with its height of nearly one meter and the width of about 60 centimeters. It is about three by two feet. The ornately decorated architectural structure of the artwork is an allegorical representation of the temple of the universe. The edifice is broken up by a remarkable array of openings on various levels and is full with architectural details. The central opening is framed with texts in a frieze-like row of blocks and medallions topped by an arch and surrounded with multitude of recesses containing narrative scenes. The whole composition is uh, populated with figures, Jewish, Jewish uh, religious items, and overbound with Kabbalistic symbols. Before turning our attention to the Bean edition of the artwork, let us have a look at the Kabbalistic content of the original lithograph. The conceptual framework behind the iconographic program is the organic worldview, the universal harmony between the macrocosm and microcosm with its intricate correspondences. This view is based on a Kabbalistic reading of Judaism, according to which it is the manifestation of the divine law that governs nature. This content is presented in a carefully calculated and didactic way and displayed through a refined and thoughtful design. It is arranged along the vertical axis of the lithograph. The visual and uh, conceptual foundation of the table is the Ein Sof, the infinite God, surrounded by the Shem HaMetavash, the 72 hidden names of God. In the focus of the lithograph, we see a balcony with a view of creation. The terrestrial globe is emerging from the clouds below the Kabbalistic tree. In other words, the Sephirotic tree, which is the traditional visual representation of the ten Sephirot, the attributes of God. The planets and the zodiac shed light on the celestial sphere. The upper section of the table, displaying a wall, is where the correspondences between the heavenly order in nature and Judaism is summarized. We see four concentric semicircles spanning across the facade dedicated to four themes. The letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the elements, planets, and the zodiac, the days of the week and the months, and the fourth considers the part of the human body. Their harmony with the celestial sphere is demonstrated by the division of the semicircles into three cross sections correlating to the numbers 3, 7, and 12. These numbers bring to light the core correlations that hold the divine and the mundane worlds together, as revealed in the Sefer Yetzirah, the book of creation or formation, 
which is the earliest esoteric book in Judaism. The book tells the story of how God created the world using ten sefirot and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And this is the reason why Rosenberg placed the Sefer Yetzirah as a visual connecting element between the universal heavenly order and our created world. It is inscribed into the 12 frames on the lintel, uh, linking the creation, uh, the creation opening and the vault. The narrative scenes provide further confirmation uh, to the overall organizing principle. We see the Passover dinner, on the other side, Sukkot, then the merit ceremony, and religious articles, Tilin, Talit, and Tzitzit. Already in 1842, Rosenberg's lithograph reached Boston, where Reverend Max Wolf, the minister of the Ohabai Shalom Congregation, encountered the print. Wolf moved to New York, where he published The Origin in 1859, together with the explicable volume in his English translation. In the introduction to the explicatory book, Wolf, Wolf tells us the circumstances and reasons for embarking upon the project of publishing the work. And I quote, some two years ago, a copy of this pictorial was presented to me in Boston. And as my house was uh, frequented by persons of various denominations, this pictorial attracted general attention, not only from the beauty of the workmanship, but also, and even in a much greater degree, from the vastness of the design and the importance of the subject. Many called upon me to explain the plan. Others, again, desired to process copies with an explication in the vernacular tongue and urged me to undertake an Anglo-American edition from the French original. In his introduction to the explication, Wolf also wrote that he, he secured the assistance of a competent artist whose skill has done justice to the pictorial portion of the work. The competent artist was Julius Bean, and in his hands, the lithograph of Rosenberg went through a metamorphosis with content, symbolism, and style all being transformed to some degree. The most conspicuous modification on the lithograph are the lack of coloring and the adding of two scenes, the circumcision in the lower left corner and the five megalot on the right hand side, which affected its layout. The religious article scene was relocated. These themes were added not only to the image, but also to the accompanying volume. As Wolf explained, I also submit translation of the author's explication, to which I have added some few remarks of my own. The reasons for specifically these additions can perhaps be explained by the fact that Wolf was both a Mohel, ritual circumciser, and a Chazan, reader. Aside from these apparent modifications, other more subtle alterations were made in the detail, namely in the style. The architectural elements, figures, ornaments, interiors, and robes were all adjusted to contemporary American fashion and taste. By way of example, the cozy dining room in which the Seder night is set has similarly been refashioned in a contemporary style. The mantel, overmantel mirror, and lamp brackets, as well as the chairs and the high chair, have been redrawn in typical mid 19th century pieces. Bean's room has uh, um, decorated walls and what looks like a patterned wall to wall, wall, -to -wall carpet. Rosenberg's backdrop like curtain had been transferred to the foreground, giving the Seder dinner the appearance of a theatrical tableau. The same was done with the Sukkot scene. The curtain of the central creation has been replaced with a stylish floral pattern and tasseled drapery. Indeed, all the ornamental elements of the design have been refined to a greater or lesser degree. As to the architectural element, 
the X-shaped metal railing in front of the creation scene was replaced by a stone railing in the Gothic revival style of the mid-19th century. The Jewish religious uh, costumes are of particular interest. Where these garments appear in Rosenberg's lithograph, they are simplified and generic, not specifically Jewish, while in Dean's the central figure in the creation scene, said to represent Adam, for example, wears a distinctly the Jewish outfit. Bean's religious clothing resembles traditional German Jewish garments, the sarba, the long black cloak of the so-called Shabbat dress, the shulmantel, and the barret, uh, a round hat. And this is not by chance, for the same costumes were used in uh, worship at the Temple Emmanuel in New York, where Bean was a congregant. The congregation was established by German Jewish immigrants who brought their religious costumes with them to the New World. The same costume worn also by the two figures officiating in the circumcision scene appears in one of Bean's earliest works too, in a decorative panel of a lithographic ketubah uh, lithographic from 1852. This marriage contract, signed by Leo Merzbacher, the founding rabbi of the congregation Emmanuel, and also a Bnei Brit member, apparently became the model for later Emmanuel Ketubot. Finally, a few words about the advertising, promotion, sale, and dissemination of the print, and its use both as a parlor ornament and as a visual uh, aid in lectures. An advertisement ran weekly for two and a half years in the Jewish Messenger, and another important Jewish periodical, the Occident carried a classified advertisement for almost a year. Well-known publishers were selling it in New York and agents in other major cities. So the lithograph and the explication entered library collections as early as 1860. Like its French predecessor, the American edition had a Masonic reading too. It was used by Jewish Freemasons to anchor the origin of Freemasonry in Judaism. In a sectarian debate that evolved within American Freemasonry at this period. Thus, Masonic periodicals also issued advertising notices. Impressions of the lithograph could be also seen and purchased on Broadway at the American Masonic Agency, a manufacturer and vendor of Masonic regalia. The lithograph was also on display in the office of the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of New York. The work was also promoted and distributed by Wolf himself on a more than year long tour. The tour included lectures on the lithograph given by Wolf and others, tailored for Jewish general and Masonic audiences. As Wolf remarks uh, on the importance of the decorative nature of the print, we may guess that uh, creating a piece with, uh, which would have a, an appeal as parlor ornamentation was a priority for both Wolf and Bean. Thus, it was imperative to adjust it to contemporary taste. A more stylish uh, the more stylish costumes and fashionable Gothic elements were intended to give uh, the, re uh, the revision of Rosenberg's lithograph broader appeal. This was apparently uh, successful for almost all the newspaper reports of the lithograph praise its beauty and decorativeness. The print was described, for example, as beautifully executed on stone and will form a handsome uh, ornament when framed. The engraving is a splendid parlor ornament. Beautifully executed engraving, well situated to adorn the walls uh, of the best uh, furnished parlor. A beautiful work, magnificent chart or engraving. It is one of the most striking and expressive um, allegories we have ever seen delineated. We never saw such a combination of the chart uh, as the chart offers. The elegance of this piece of art renders it worthy of ornamenting any parlor and so on. But it was also no doubt acquired as a focus of discussion and teaching. 
the promotional notice in the Occident reported uh, on the Kabbalistic significance of the dreams, saying that to those anxious in, the, in these matters, the work will furnish a great mine of reflection and study, even to the indifferent, it furnishes matter of uncommon uh, interest. Attention was drawn both to its religious and Masonic significance. For example, every Mason and every theologian should have it. The chart may be termed a system of uh, philosophy uh, uh, of religion to the Masonic no less than the biblical student. This work of Brother Wolves is valuable and so on. The metamorphosis of Rosenberg's lithograph in the hands of Julius Beam can tell us a good deal about American lithography, the statics and New York jewelry in the final years of the antebellum era. Both artistic and business considerations were evidently significant in the decision to remake the lithograph for an American market. Beam's reinterpretation of it reveals both his German Jewish identity and his understanding of a contemporary American architectural, decorative, and sartorial fashions. The origin of the rite and worship of the Hebrews represent the extraordinary talents of Julius Beam, whose career spent six decades and embraced every form of commercial panographic printing and publishing and left its mark on American lithography and cartography. And I shall probably not go wrong in assuming that as a long-term president of Maybrick, his personal traits and sense of social responsibility left their mark on the order as well, including the remarkable adaptability which is evident, evidenced, evinced by the refashioning of this magnific magnificent artwork. Thank you very much. And in case you want to learn more about Julius Bean and this lithograph, you are more than welcome to visit my page at academia.edu. Thank you again.